One of the cool things about it, too, is some of these different places have some specialization. Penn State is kind of one of the more general operational forecasts, maybe one of the better overall teaches you kind of a very balanced, you know, if you go through, you get kind of all sides, right? For a long time, there's were those stats about the percentage of operational meteorologists that had come out of Penn State, and that was pretty high. Now, other places have different focuses. Um, obviously, Oklahoma, that's one we haven't mentioned, the University of Oklahoma, big on severe weather. Florida schools tend to have more of a focus towards tropical weather, a hurricane situation. I would think some of those SUNY schools would probably have some expertise on uh, lake effect and, and winter weather too. So, you know, you can kind of map out your kind of focus, Mississippi State, they've gotten much better operationally in terms of their overall, but their focus has been broadcast meteorology and, and done a good job, not only for actual folks getting a meteorology degree from that school, but also training other broadcasters to be broadcast meteorologists. So a lot of different ways to go in this, which is kind of exciting because we're finding that nexus between meteorology and ways of life you know, finding more and more interest in people are are able to specialize more. Is that is that a good summation? Do you guys think? Yeah, I know Penn State too. When I was going through only a few years ago, now um, they have different options that you can do. So you can do the broadcast option. You can do general meteorology, where it could be like a mix of certain disciplines you want to go into. You can go into. So you can kind of tailor tailor what you want to do in terms of within Penn State. Now that's great. Yeah, Yeah. and you can do like weather risk management. That's a really big thing. Um, I know Millersville also does a graduate program for that, and then they also do at Penn State um, like atmospheric science, uh, which is like the research option. So like for myself, I did the weather operations and broadcasting, but more on the operations and on the broadcasting. But then once I got into my senior year, I was thinking about doing research. So I started taking more of those atmospheric science classes. So I was actually in the general option, but I had like both like, so I could go either into operations or I could do grad school after I was done my my degree. Your generation, Dan, I mean, it was the options were more limited. The jobs were more limited in terms of uh, there wasn't as much specialization. Maybe there was broadcasting, there was media, and there was energy was another, you know, and, and that's, you know, energy and transportation have become their own offshoots now that need so much more specialized forecasting. Yeah, the amount of options you have now in school, the amount of jobs that you have out of school. I think the one thing that we as a field have done better lately and need to continue to do better is, is ensuring that students know the different options that you have after you graduate. Um, There's jobs that employ a meteorologist that are adjacent to meteorology that people don't even know are a potential path for them. Um, As you mentioned, Dean, there's, you know, there's energy, there's commodities, there's working for any type of private company and being a meteorologist, there's transportation, transportation, yeah, huge right now. Emergency management and trying to make sure there's, you know, emergency management for like a public safety standpoint and public preparedness. There's also business continuity from more of the private sector standpoint, making sure businesses are prepared for weather disasters or other disasters at at their facilities. So, yeah. And even like through Penn state, you can also do minors and stuff. So like if you end up coming into college with some credits from say you took advanced placement courses when you were in high school, those actually count for college credits, depending on your grade on the test. And so if you come in with credits, then you have the options of like kind of choosing what you want to specialize in, not only meteorology wise, but for example, myself, I ended up getting a minor in geography and in climatology as well. So like you can kind of do that as well while you're getting your degree. So it's just about like being, it's a big puzzle that you have to put together. And I think that's also why I love meteorology because it's a big pattern and a big puzzle that you're just continuously putting together. So every day is different and you get, you get to the next day and the pieces are all mixed up again. Right. And you have to almost start from scratch. Um, Obviously, especially for uh, many of the the really good operational programs, uh, really good math, really good science, try to to beef that uh, education up as much as possible uh, early on. You know, and I think it's, you know, when I was growing up, it was about being a, somebody on TV or, or radio. I mean, that was kind of a thing. But now I think it's more about, you know, Nikki's approach where I can do so many different things and there's so much uh, opportunity there. It's it's nice to see this excitement again for meteorology. I think it had waned a bit, maybe for a few decades. Is that a fair statement? 
Yeah, I think you get different, you know, it's sort of ebb and flow based on what weather has occurred and, um, you know, what inspires people to be involved in in the weather. I mean, right now, there's just, it seems like we're in a stretch of, I, I, I would imagine that children who are growing up right now, who are sort of inclined to focus on those types of things are really, there's certainly not a lack of weather events across the country mm-hmm. and the world to be right. excited about from a scientific standpoint or or concerned about from an impact to, to, to people standpoint. So I think both of those things inspire people to want to go into whatever they're they're interested in. Nikki, as a, a female, um, this has been a male-dominated uh, industry and, and early on, but we've been seeing that changing right before our eyes. Even when I look at the makeup of, of the classes, each class at Penn State now, the increased number of females, also the broad spectrum of people who are training and becoming meteorologists, it's encouraging. And, and I'm sure as a female meteorologist, uh, having more of, of that around you and, and seeing that transpire is, is, is rewarding. And, and honestly, you have to be excited. You were kind of on that cutting edge of that again here in your generation. That's, that's got to be a, an amazing thing. Yeah, I think when I was training, I trained with Mary Gilbert, who is also one of our meteorologists at AccuWeather. We were, I think, the first time that two females are being trained at the same exact time. That's great that the field is is going towards that. And um, I was actually just talking to one of the professors at Penn State the other week, and he was saying that the undergrad class is about a 50-50 split between females and males. Um, But then when you move to the graduate program, um, the female percentage really drops off and it's still predominantly male. You know, when you have the the groundswell of of, of more diversity on the undergraduate level, I mean, that will take its while to to percolate up to the, the, the graduate level. To listen to the full episode, just click the links below and never miss a podcast by subscribing to Everything Under the Sun on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. New episodes every Friday.